Thanks. It, just so I don't uh, forget to mention this, David Schaefer, uh, who works for Cairn University, which is where I teach, uh, just north of Philadelphia, is here representing the school. Uh, and uh, if, if you send any students to that school, uh, they require a three-hour theology proper for every undergrad, any major, has to take the theology proper course. Uh, which is, I don't know of any other college, I don't know of any other college in America that requires that actually. Three, I don't even know of any seminaries that require a three hour theology proper. I had two, I had two hours in my own training um, and we didn't talk about any of this uh, that we're talking about today. Um, so uh, if, you, if you talk to David, you know anybody up in the Northeast quarter or have, have some students that think they wanna sojourn for some time in the beautiful Northeast, I will say this, you've got us beat on weather, we've got you beat on color. Uh, it was just, it was all red and gold when I flew out. So David's going to make a presentation later and is around, so be, be sure you talk with him. Uh, Dr. Renahan said that we learn that we know so little, but we're knowing more. And I, this is my promise at the beginning of every semester to my students. And this is probably not going to be like any other class. At the end of the semester, I want, you to ha I want you to sense that you know God better and that you know him far less than you thought you did. And that this is, and it's going to be a kind of strange feel. You know, it's not like other arts and sciences where we're going to we're going to know more at the end. We're going to sort of we're going to sort of get get more comprehension. I said I'm, I'm going to try to actually make you sense that you comprehend less and that you know better. Uh, and I and it's a uh, I don't know of anything else beside the study of God that we could say that because this is the study of the infinite, the, the delighting of our souls in the one whom our thoughts and language could never exhaust. I um, always say this is, what, this is the joy of eternity. The incomprehensibility, the inexhaustibleness of our God is actually the joy of eternity because it means, I like to say, there's not some last thing about God that you're going to find out. There's not some last truth about God so that one day somewhere uh, in the eternal life you're gonna say, okay, <clears throat> done with theology proper, next. <laughs> this, will be, this will be an inexhaustible source of delight to our souls in his, in his presence and glory for all eternity. And I think that's, that's an encouragement. If, I could, if we could get that sense, uh, even, even in, these, in these talks, that's important. I want us to look at, in this lecture, the doctrine of God's eternity. In our confession, uh, like all standard Reformed confessions, we confess his eternity. Uh, and I, I'm focusing on eternity because I think in, in particular there is also a drift towards some form of divine temporalism. Uh, God as somehow moving through successive moments, that also is a kind of trend that our confession intends to stand against and yet we're finding it increasingly difficult to stand against that. The doctrine of God's eternity is at once one of the most uncontested truths of the Reformed Confessions. I don't know of anyone that wants to say God is not eternal. I know people that want to say God is not simple, but I've, I've not met anyone that says God isn't eternal, except, except for Wolterstorff. We'll talk about him. It's one of the most uncontested truths of the Reformed Confessions, and at one and the same time, one of the most difficult to understand. I am not going to explain divine eternity to you this morning, uh, but I am going to give us some ways to avoid misconstruing it, that, if I can put it that way. God is the King Eternal, 1 Timothy 1.17, the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 1.8, the one whose years have no end, Psalm 102.27, and who is from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 90, verse 2. He exists exalted above all time as its creator and as its Lord. He does not have his life or his existence computed and measured out to him by increments of succession. His life is not ahead of him or behind him. Uh, he is identical with all that is in him. He just is his own life. Rather, as his simplicity demands, he is perfectly identical with all that is in him. There are not bits of his life coming and bits flowing away. And yet... The Lord who is the creator and Lord over all time reveals himself in time and unfolds his sovereign purpose in time. So the eternal God reveals himself temporally and administers his eternal plan successively. All of our knowledge of him arises from our standpoint in the temporal created order. Every thought you've had of God is from a revelation of God that you have received in time. 
So we come to speak of him as he reveals himself through his mighty deeds and his words, one after another and in succession. And for this reason, our talk about God is inextricably time-bound. Our terminology, can't, we can't transcend our temporality. It's what we are. Because we are creatures who change, we are creatures who are in time, and because our experience has been ever of, of only things that are temporal, we cannot, in a certain sense, break free of our temporal talk about God. In our God talk, our talk about His attributes, there's a profound non-symmetry between the temporal-shaped terms that we use to describe him and the concepts we use to describe him and, the etern- and, and his eternity and the ontological reality of that eternity in him. So we describe God who is without time as the ancient of days. You see what I'm saying? Ancient sounds like old, but if God is eternal, God isn't old and God isn't young. You see what I'm saying? He is. There's not some way to measure. His life is not measurable. So he cannot be old or young. He is not somewhere in some progress that's measurable. Augustine of Hippo, who of all the patristics wrote so profoundly on God's eternity in his famous Confessions, and if you've, if you've stuck with it through to those last books 10 to 13 of the Confessions, uh, when he starts talking about eternity, and if you've ever been through that, your, mind, your head is just spinning. But Augustine says this, and we can see even in Augustine that one who believes that God is not timeless can't escape time-like terms. He says, I've got, by the way, the Confessions, like Anselm's Proslogion, is just one great prayer to God. Augustine says, Your years do not come and go. Our years pass and new ones arrive, only so that all may come in turn, but your years stand all at once because they are stable. There is no pushing out of vanishing years by those that are coming on, because because with you none are transient. Your today does not give way to tomorrow, nor follow yesterday. Your today is eternity. That's why I said I'm not going to explain divine eternity to you. Uh, Even the fact that he's using words like today and years shows that there, he doesn't believe that God has a today as opposed to yesterday and tomorrow, that God has some proximity on a timeline. He doesn't believe that God has years, 365 days, uh, the earth you know, rotating on its axis and, and uh, orbiting around the sun. Uh, he doesn't believe God has years, but in a certain sense, how do you get away from the language of years and days? It's, it's, it's the way that we, we describe God who is not subject to years and days, with this language, but he's, again, you can see what Augustine's doing. He's denying that God is really subject to these things in the way that we are. The Puritan John Owen recognizes God's eternity as a great mystery. Maybe for those of you who feel this way, this will be some consolation. He says, How inconceivable is this glorious property unto the thoughts and minds of men? How weak are the ways and terms whereby they go about to express it? How 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 inadequate is our language to speak of eternity, he's saying. He goes on, he, and I love this, listen carefully, he that says most signifies what he, uh, only signifies what he knows of what it is not. He who says most about divine eternity only signifies what he, know, what he knows of what it is not. In other words, what he's saying, it's, it's Charnock's statement. We cannot comprehend him as he is, but we must not fancy him to be what he is not. What he is not. Our descriptions of divine eternity are, the, are the, the, the exercise of removing finitude and creatureliness from God. But that doesn't mean you comprehend eternity. But, you, but again, you know that the alternative is not acceptable. Um, so he says, we only know what it's not. He, he goes on, we are of yesterday change every moment, and we are leaving our station tomorrow. God is the same, and was so before the world was from eternity. And then I love this line from Owen, and, and take some consolation in this. This is, this is what I, who I consider the greatest, greatest English-speaking Reformed theologian. Um, he says, And now I cannot think what I have said, but have only intimated what I adore. I just said something about eternity, and I can't even form a conception in my mind of what I've said, but I do adore it. That's, that's important for, our, for all of our theology. The great mystery of God's eternity, though not comprehensible in itself, does not leave us speechless. It doesn't mean that we can't say anything. I mean, that's Owen's point. He who says most, he's not saying don't talk about it. He's saying just recognize that you're not comprehending it with your language. It seems that we can at least say some things that it is not. 
in, a, in particular, our God talk must eschew all notion of change in God. That much Owen is willing to say. I am of yesterday, leaving my station uh, tomorrow. I change, God does not. Now, I don't comprehend what immutability and etern- the, the complement of eternity means, but I know it's not change. Okay? So it doesn't mean that we can say nothing. Uh, we reject all change. Whatever we say of God's work in the world, creation, judgment, redemption, consummation, we must insist that this work produces no change in God. However we're to describe God, let us not make God temporal. Let us not make God changeable. There, are, I'll get to the motives for this. But this is, this is a, a hard proposition for many modern theologians. It inevitably brings the classical doctrine of eternity into conflict with the basic demands of theistic personalism, which requires give and take, genuine reciprocity, mutuality. If God is to be really related to the world in a give and take fashion, as theistic personalists believe, it's requisite that that for God to count as truly personal, he must somehow exist in some way that allows him to experience the fluctuations of time. Because only then is he really related. That's the idea. How else could he be affected by temporal creatures? How else could he respond to their actions in any meaningful sense? Thus, God must be temporal in some respect in order to create and to act on the world in some meaningful and personal sense. If God is going to relate himself to the world, he's going to have to relate himself to the world as something in time in order for that relation to be special, for that relation to be meaningful. That's the idea. Now, not all theistic personalists are agreed on how to characterize this alleged divine temporality, but all agree that God has to, in some way, shape, or form, assume some temporality into into his life in order to meaningfully relate to us. In particular, particular, I think creation itself is is really the fulcrum, the, the focus point, where this where this conviction sort of finds its argument, which is to say, if creation is not eternal, if creation began to be, and God is creator, then God began to be creator. So now God as creator must be temporal. See what I'm saying? Because creatorhood was not. Sort of the day before, on creation eve, God was not yet creator is the idea. And then when he created, he became what he wasn't prior to creating. That's the idea. And so this, this argument is leveraged to say creation is where we find God beginning to be in some way temporal. I want to push back on that. My aim in this, in this lecture is to make the case that the traditional doctrine of eternity requires one to confess, the, to confess God as the eternal creator of the temporal world. This is, this is a kind of distillation of my article last, last May uh, for... Journal of the Institute of Reformed Baptist Studies, but I I think it's an important point that we need to consider. So I first want to set out the basic features of the classical doctrine, uh, awe, temporality, timeless eternality. Um, What exactly did Christians of old, and especially our Reformed predecessors, believe about divine eternity? Then secondly, I want to examine some of the recent temporalist approaches uh, that dissent from the traditional doctrine, and then finally I want to set forth the argument that God is in fact Uh, that creator is not something that God became after for a long time he wasn't that. See what I'm saying? We have to confess eternal creator. Um, Strange as that is, uh, and and I'll I'll end with Owen again, that I I do not, I cannot conceive what I have said, uh, but I do adore, and there are reasons for saying it. First then, fundamentals of the classical uh, eternity doctrine. We'll, just, we'll work through a little bit of this. What does, what does it mean in its traditional form? What are the arguments for it? What supports the doctrine? And then we'll move on to some dissent from it. First, the meaning of divine eternity. The basic claim of the classical eternity doctrine is that God does not experience successive states of being, that he has no future and no past. God is not on the way, so to speak. God is not moving through moments like you and I are incessantly moving through moments. Positively, divine eternity derives from the belief that God is so perfect and so infinite in being that no new state of being can come upon him and no state of being can slip away from him. But if he goes through time, he has to acquire something that was not, and he has to lose something that was, because time is the measurement of motion, of change. We'll get into that a little bit. God is purely and infinitely actual in all that he is, so he cannot move through moments, which are the measurement of change. Boethius, 
uh, gives a classic definition, a sixth century philosopher and theologian, describes God's eternity as, quote, the whole simultaneous and perfect possession of boundless life. The whole simultaneous and perfect possession of boundless life. A bounded life, by contrast, a boundless life is God's. A bounded life, by contrast, is one that comes into our possession little by little and slips out about the same rate. Little by little. It's a life that we're living through successive moments. Your future is not actual. Your past no longer is. Okay? These are actualities, moments of being that have slipped out or not arrived. The Boethian formula, the whole simultaneous possession of boundless life, was basically reproduced by classical Christian orthodoxy for, mille for a millennia after he says it. When we get to the Reformation period and to the Reform scholastics, we find the same affirmation. Francis Turretin unfolds the meaning of this, of divine eternity. He says, true eternity has been defined by the scholastics as the interminable possession of life, life without limit, life without terms or boundary, complete, perfect, and at once. That's, that's Boethius in the, in the language of a Protestant. Thus, it excludes succession no less than end, uh, and it ought to be conceived as a standing, but not a flowing now. A, not a now that is situated between a then and a not yet. A now that just is. I am, not I was and I am not yet. If I can put it in terms of the divine name. Turton goes on, the reason is because nothing flows away with time from the life of God as from ours. God has every moment at once whatever we have, whatever we have dividedly by succession of time. Hence, philosophers have well said that neither the future nor the past, he will be or was, but only the present, he is, can properly be applied to him. Okay? Now, improperly, we can say... Uh, who was, is, and is to come. We can't improperly, in an accommodated way, speak about God from the temporal standpoint with regard to his external revelation of himself and his dealings with us. But in himself, we cannot say he was or is not yet. For the eternal duration of God embraces indeed all time, the past, present, and future, but nothing in him can be past or future because his life remains always the same and immutable. Your life slips away. Moment, new moments and experiences bring you new actualities. Time is the measurement of the movement between these states of actuality. Gerhardus Voss, uh, most notably known for his biblical theology, but uh, if you've seen this new publication of his Reform Dogmatics, these are really his lecture notes uh, when he taught theology proper at Calvin Seminary before he came to Princeton in the late 19th century. Uh, and what we're finding out is that Gerhardus Voss, uh, for, all of his, for all of his wonderful help in biblical theology, did not abandon the classical scholastic positions. Gerhardus Voss says of divine, of divine eternity that it is that attribute of God whereby he is exalted above all limitation of time and all succession of time, and in a single indivisible present possesses the content of his life perfectly, and then Voss says this, and this will become important in a few moments. And as such, that is to say, as not a successive being, as such is the cause of time. The timeless one causes time. That's Voss. For Voss, God is not an object in the progress of redemption. God stands above the progress. God stands above the narrative of redemption as its Lord, as its maker, as its sustainer. That which is perfect and indivisible in being cannot be subject to change, mutation, or movement. It can't acquire actuality or lose actuality. Turretin writes this, For he is not always the same for whom every moment something anteriorly is removed and by whom uh, posteriorly something is added. If something actual about you slips away and something new about you comes to be, you are not always the same. You're not immutable. So he goes on. The succession and the flow of the parts of duration, necessarily, which exists successively, necessarily involve a certain species of motion. That is, that's an old-fashioned word for change. That's what all, motion meant change. Which, and it still does. Which, in which he says cannot be applied to God. Successive duration or time is a measurement of motion between states of being. State of being A, state of being B, you move from this state of actuality to this, time is the measurement of the motion between them. Okay? 
if there is anything in your life that succeeds anything else as a state of actuality, I mean, it could be as simple as state of actuality in which my hand is at rest on the, on the podium uh, precedes the state of actuality in which my hand is raised off the podium. We have two states or terms of being. Term, term A is my hand in this position. Term B is my hand raised. Time is the measurement of the motion between the two terms of actuality. Time is nothing but the measurement of change. But if something does not begin to be in any way what it was not, there cannot be a measurement of movement between states of being. That's the, arg that's the basic, arg that's the basically reformed argument for God's eternality, which isn't really reformed, it's classical. Catholic, as we said, in that, in that broad orthodox sense. Um, yeah, every, and, and you can all do that. You can all just, I think I saw someone raise their hand back there. Good, you're measuring the motion of change. That's, that's great. Um, Stephen, Char Stephen Charnock said, yeah, I know, just you can, you can apply it. It's perfect. Stephen Charnock says, all other things pass from one state to another, from their original to their eclipse and destruction, but God possesses his being in one indivisible point, having neither beginning and nor middle. That's the basic claim of the, do of the classical doctrine. And I'm, I'm gonna guess that most of you, maybe you haven't put it in terms exactly like that, but the idea of timelessness is something like that. How to deal then with the Bible's language about eternity becomes a bit of a challenge because the Bible uses eternity language in a very elastic way sense, um, and, I, and I don't, in a kind of, in a, in, a in, a, in, a, in a sense that's fine, but it's, it's, not, it's not exactly uh, all temporality. So one challenge we face in, in uh, the traditional doctrine is understanding God's eternity with reference to biblical passages. First off, Scripture applies the language of eternity in an improper fashion. And improper does not mean uh, unacceptable. I mean, when it says that God has a right arm or when it talks about God's bowels, that's an improper attribution that conveys some truth, but under the form of something that isn't technically true. See what I'm saying? So the Bible will do this with eternity language to describe things that in themselves are not really eternal, that actually begin to be. It, it speaks, for instance, of created and temporal things under the language of eternity. It speaks in Genesis 17 of an eternal covenant, but it's a covenant that was ratified in time with Abraham. It speaks of an eternal possession of the land, Genesis 17, 8. But how could there be an eternal possession if there's not an eternal land? See what I'm saying? There's a kind of imprecise way of speaking. It speaks of eternal Mosaic rites, ceremonies, and promises. But wait a minute. Are the Mosaic rites, ceremonies, and promises all eternal? I've never taken a lamb or a, or a bullock up to Mount Zion to offer sacrifice. In other words, there are parts of the Mosaic economy, rites and ceremonies, that already are gone. See what I'm saying? They're eternal, he calls them, but they're, they are already gone. Okay? Speaks of the eternal mountains. Again, eternal mountains. Uh, but the mountains were created. They began to be, Genesis 49. Of Solomon's temple on Mount Zion as God's eternal dwelling place. And yet already that temple is gone, and even Mount Zion itself will be subject to the consuming fire of judgment in the future, and presumably refashioned as, the, as we enter the new heaven and new earth, refashioned or replaced, however you take that. Uh, but yet he calls it God's eternal dwelling place. The earth is, he describes the earth as immovable forever and ever, Psalm 104, 5. He speaks of the eternal life that God gives to his elect, but yet it's an eternal life that begins at some moment. Okay, and it extends forever forward. An eternal weight of glory presently being produced in believers. An eternal heavenly home awaiting God's people. Interesting language to call these things eternal. Every one of these realities has a temporal beginning, proceeds through a succession of moments. Some of these things that I've mentioned have already passed away and will never return, like certain aspects of the Mosaic rites. Others will pass away at the end of the present age when God destroys the world and brings an end to, the econ to this economy of things. Still others will go on endlessly into the future, but not because they were forever in the past. Eternal life. Your eternal life has a definitive term of beginning, and it will not have a term of ending or, or end, an end point. Why does the Bible call things that, strictly speaking, are temporal eternal? How is the Bible describing these things as eternal? Francis Turton observes that the eternalist language of Scripture is used in these various temporal things. He says, because on account of their long continuance and constant duration, they seem to approach eternity. That is to say, 
The reason these things are called eternal is because they are more enduring than other things. It's a kind of compare. It's being used in a kind of imprecise, comparative way. Um, that that our life, while not strictly eternal, because it begins to be, is called eternal because because it is more enduring than all other forms of life. It's a it's being used comparatively. He goes on, or it may be used for that which has no end, although it might have had a beginning, as the angels and the souls are eternal. They're more, these temporal things are more enduring and stable than other temporal things, and thus they seem, to be, they seem to more closely imitate the unchanging eternity of God. They're not strictly unchanging, but they seem more like the unchanging God than other changing things. And so in a kind of condescended, honorific way, God calls these temporal things eternal. Secondly then, so in this case, eternity is a comparative term in those instances, denoting temporal things that are more permanent than other temporal things. That's, I think that's how Scripture is using eternity in those passages. On the other hand, Scripture uses, uh, while it uses eternal as terms to describe things that are strictly temporal, it also uses temporal imagery to speak of God's eternity. Okay? Uh, he is called in Daniel 7, 9, the ancient of days. In Psalm 102, 27, it says, he says that his years have no end. His eternity in Psalm 40, or Isaiah 43 is said to be from the day. Interesting language. Psalm 90 verse 2 says that he is before creation and that he is from everlasting to everlasting. Are we to take all of these descriptions of God as, in terms of the mode of description, uh, strictly literal? Is God ancient so as to be thought of as very old? Is his life parceled out by years and days, which are measures, computation, computative measures of change? Is his existence chronologically prior to the world? Was there a creation eve? See what I'm saying? Was there a moment in the life of God where God was not what he is now? Was there, is it a, is a, is it a chronological priority? And does God advance from one state of everlastingness to another? Does he leave his original everlastingness to become a new everlastingness? See what I'm saying? Scripture, scripture is using these uh, expressions, I think, in an, in an analogical and metaphorical way to describe what, in a certain sense, can't be said, as Owen said, what, can't, what language can't quite grasp. Wilhelmus Sabrockel. By the way, if you don't, if you don't know Wilhelmus Sabrockel, his his four volumes, The Christian's Reasonable Service. Let me. I know it's not published by RBAP, but I think it's okay to, to recommend the non-RBAP book. I don't see Rich. Oh, there's Richard back there. Yeah, no. It's. Uh, I'm recommending something you didn't publish, Richard. So, uh, if you know Wilhelmus Sabrockel, Christian's Reasonable Service, I I strongly recommend that you spend some time with Sabrockel. He's, he's wonderful. One of these Dutch Second Reformation writers. He says this. Even when years or days or past and present times are attributed to God, and he is called the ancient of days and other similar expressions, such is merely done from man's viewpoint. The reason for this is that we, insignificant human beings and capable of thinking and speaking about eternity in a fitting manner, by what may by way of comparison comprehend as much of the eternity as is needful for us to know. Nevertheless, in doing so, we must fully divorce God from the concept of time. That's, that's a brockle. Uh, and I think that's his point. He's saying God is packaging what can't be comprehended under the form and terms of language that we, can, that we can get to. No, God isn't ancient in the sense of old, but there's some truth in that. Well, if he isn't ancient, then why call him ancient? Because that which is ancient is revered above all others. When it says ancient of days, it doesn't mean he's very old. It's making a comparative term. We respect that which is very old, but God is, God is comparatively the one who's the ancient, not just of this day or that, but of days. The idea is to be revered above all days. It's actually an ascription of eternity, but in the language and idiom of time. That's, that's the work of doing this doctrine. Uh, uh, Jerome Zankius says that we begin in time... Uh, we being in time cannot understand those things in God, in God that are eternal, but after a manner of things temporal, and such words as signify time. You can't, you can't speak non-time words, you see what I'm saying? Even eternity, uh, we tend to think of it as sort of time stretched out or something like this. We, we're, it's, it's very difficult, impossible actually, to break out of our time boundedness. And scripture stoops to use that language to give us a sense of God's transcendence, even though we use words like days and years and, and now and then and temporal type language, before and after, all that. 
thirdly then, there's also a challenge. The understanding how Scripture speaks in these ways, accommodated talk about creation, accommodated talk about God. Uh, there's also the difficulty of God's unfolding effects in time. God administers His covenant and His purpose historically, successively, through moments. And the, the thinking goes that if God's, if God's purpose unfolds in time, then God, as the one who is doing all these works, must be a temporal agent. If God's, if God's works unfold in time, then God has to be in time because everybody who does something one after another has to, in a certain sense, exist in a way one after another. That's the temptation, to think that because God's purposes and plan and works unfold through time, God must be in time. Turretin says this, When the actions of God are considered as either past, present, or future, this is not said with respect to their efficient reason. He means with respect to their cause, which is God. He says, but in reference to the effects and the objects. That is to say, the before and the after is not in the action of God. It's in the thing upon which God is acting. It's in, it's in the thing that he produces that we find the before, before and the after, not in the act of producing. That's what Turton is saying. He says, these effects which are produced in diverse times uh, and on which his acts are terminated. It is not in his acting that we find before and after. It is in the, thi- it is in the acts themselves, it is in the things acted, so to speak the things that he produces. I'll come to that again. To sustain this position then will require a few other doctrines. In other words, I think to come to Scripture and say, give me a timeless eternity proof text uh, is going to be very difficult to find a single text that says timeless. I think there are some. I think the the text uh, in Titus uh, and in Jude and in uh, in Timothy where Paul says that God is is, um, before all ages or before all times actually does give a very strong transcendence that God is not God is not part of the chronon. That's his language. God is not among the chronological things. He's the creator of them. I do think a few of those texts get us very near timelessness, but there are other dogmatic motivations for the doctrine that really bolster the timelessness view. The first is divine infinity. I'll move through these quickly. The first is divine infinity. Edward Lee defines divine infinity this way. And Edward Lee is one of those old Puritans who, uh, the last time Edward Lee was published in English, was 1662, to my knowledge. That was the, at least his theology. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can get Joel Beakey uh, to, to, to rescind the ban on Lee for some reason and bring him back, because his theology is probably the first complete systematic theology in the English language. Edward Lee defines infinity this way, as that whereby God cannot be limited, measured, or determined of anything, being the first cause from whom and the end whereby all things are made. He says, thus God is altogether free from limitation of time, place, or degrees. Bavink says it this way, and, I, and I, I, love, I love this statement. He says, one who says time says motion, change, measurability, computability, limitation, finiteness, creature. Close quote. Time is the measurement of change. That which is infinite cannot change because it cannot acquire being it lacked because it was infinite. It cannot lose being it had lest it be no longer infinite. Therefore, since there can be no change in the infinite God, because that which is infinite cannot receive additional states of being, there can be no measurement of movement between states of being. Therefore, an infinite God cannot be in time, cannot be successive. The doctrine of immutability also argues this. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says, the idea of eternity follows immutability as the idea of time follows movement. Hence, as God is supremely immutable, it supremely belongs to him to be eternal. John Gill says that eternity and immutability, quote, infer one another. I mean, that's, just, that's, that's Gill giving a nod toward Thomas that that argument's sound. So that's, a good, that's a good point. Wilhelmus of Brockel uh, says that God unchangeably exists while time is a progression summarizes this idea of change. If time is a numbering of motion or change, it should be clear why an immutable God cannot be temporal, because there cannot be states of being for time to measure in him. I'll leave it with that. Divine simplicity, surprise, also proves this doctrine. Uh, we've, been, we've been over this territory, uh, but I think we should see this point as well. Eternity follows from divine simplicity and its denial that God is composed of parts. If God were in time, then the full actuality of his life would be built up out of temporal parts, temporal moments, bits of actuality and experience that come to him one after another. That is, of really distinct before and after moments. Temporal beings 
must necessarily exhibit a variety of existential states since time is nothing but the measurement of movement between those states, but a simple being can't have states of being that are really distinct from other states of being. See what I'm saying? I mean, a simple God can't have a bit of this and a bit of that, and collectively together you have God. Therefore, since there can't be a bit of this and a bit of that, there can't be any measurement of movement between this and that, and therefore God cannot be in time. Again, Wilhelmus of Rockle. There can be no chronology within the being of God since his being is simple and immutable. Brockle saw precisely that simplicity roots this, tempor this awe-temporal or timelessness claim. Again, a Brockle. Then what is God's eternity? Time is a measurement, in a certain sense, a, a metric that stands over against you and sort of measures out your life. It's a, it's a measure that quantifies the movement of your life. Is eternity like a, like a metric or a measure that measures God's life? That would seem to say that there's something, there's some standard that measures God outside of God, sort of like time and change are standards that measure you. A Brockle gets this perfectly. He says that God's being is eternity, and eternity is God's being. God, God isn't in eternity. God is eternity. That's what Barakal's saying, and I think that's, that's actually the most careful way to step through this thought. All right, contemporary descent from this. How, why, why do people, uh, why do people uh, struggle with this doctrine, beside the fact that we don't comprehend it? Beside the fact that, we can't, uh, that I can't form a thought of this, I can't think, I can't think awe temporality. I can say it, I can, I can say what it is not and what must be implied, but I can't, that's like nothing. That's like nothing I know, nothing I've ever experienced. The classical eternity doctrine uh, is related to all these other doctrines, but its coherence uh, within the galaxy of other traditional doctrines notwithstanding, it appears to many modern theologians to lock God out of meaningful relationship with the world. If God is not in time, if God is not going along with me, then God is absent and not meaningfully related to me. For this reason, a number of, number of evangelicals, including some Calvinists, have undertaken to either replace modify or augment the classical doctrine of God's eternality in order to allow God a bit of give and take within the time frame, the, to the temporal framework of our lives. All right, I want to look at a few of these options. The first two I'll move through quickly. Uh, that is the view of, of Nicholas Wolterstorff, and then I'll look briefly at the view of William Lane Craig. Uh, Nicholas Wolterstorff uh, basically denies that timelessness is in any way plausible, and that eternality really is just everlastingness, that God, he, he actually says we should get rid of the language eternal entirely and just replace it with the term everlasting, because that has the idea of just a perpetual, unceasing succession or movement through time. Uh, sort of like maybe how we've all thought at one point or another, that eternity just means that God's life is kind of like stretched out unendingly in either direction, something like that. Wolterstorff says, yeah, that'll do. That's the doctrine of eternality. And he makes his argument particularly because he says if God acts in time, God has to, in a certain sense, be in time in order to pull off temporal action. His words. He argues, quote, if we accept this biblical picture of God as acting for the renewal of human life, we must conceive him as everlasting rather than eternal. God the Redeemer cannot be a God eternal. That's, this is, these are his words. Like I think I said last night, I like the boldness of Wolterstorff. When he disagrees with the classical doctrine, he just goes all in and tells you, get rid of it. Uh, in some ways, it's not as confusing as others. He says, this is so because God the Redeemer is a God who changes. His emphasis changes. He realizes that eternality is predicated on immutability, and if you dump immutability, you really don't have any basis to keep the old eternality doctrine going. He says, any being which changes is a being among whose states there is temporal succession. That's a very accurate description of the classical view, and he is saying, but he does change, because look, he's a redeemer, and redeemer involves him in the kind of the timeline and the narrative of redemption, and therefore he must be a God who changes, therefore everlasting. His concern is really straightforward. Some things God does in history follow after other things God does in history. So there's a, there's a sequence in the, of the divine effects. There must be something about the divine actor which allows him to do what he previously did not do and to cease doing what he once did. 
God doesn't speak to Moses from the burning bush at the same moment in which he parts the Red Sea waters. Therefore, since there's a succession in God's dealings, there must be a succession in God's being, because only temporal beings can pull off temporal action. Folterstorff asked this question. Does not this sort of succession, you know, speaking to Moses, parting the Red Sea, does not this sort of succession constitute a change on God's time strand, he calls it? Not a change in his essence, but nonetheless a change on his time strand. He concludes that if God begins to do what he previously did not, then he, quote, then his life, quote, uh, his life and existence itself is temporal. Basically, let's just go in for temporalism. God can't begin to do what he didn't do if he isn't temporal. End of story, temporal God. William Lane Craig offers a slightly, that's the temporal God view. William Lane Craig offers what I call, call a timelessness turned temporal God view. In other words, God once was timeless, once wasn't going through moments, but now that he's created, he is. Uh, God, the, uh, other theologians agree with the temporal God view that if God, if God interacts with or creates, he must be temporal in some respect, but they don't agree with Wolterstorff that God was always temporal, that God was always going through moments. William Lane Craig uh, advocates, based on, based on Proverbs 8.22, uh, wisdom speaking about being begotten of God before creation, uh, 2 Timothy 1.9, Titus 1.2, Jude 25, all arguments that I think are some of the strongest showing, showing timelessness. He says, because of this, there must be some sense in which God was timeless, in a, in a very real sense. On the other hand, once God creates the world, he seems to enter a new relationship as creator and as sustainer, and it's difficult to imagine how he could remain timeless now that he is created. It's kind of like timelessness without creation, but once he creates, he's committed, and he's got to, get, he's got to somehow start changing in order to keep up with and deal with his world. He explains the motive for affirming temporality this way. By virtue of his creating the temporal world, God comes into a relation with the world the moment it springs into being. So there's a moment in God's life in which, if you can think of it this way, there's no creation, timeless. Creation, you know, let there be, and there's creation. At that point, God has to become temporal. He says, thus, even if it is not the case that God is temporal prior to his creation of the world, he undergoes an extrinsic change at the moment of creation which draws him into time in virtue of his real relation to the world. Prior to creation, timeless. With creation, temporal. There's, a, there's definitely a theistic personalism at work here. If God creates, he's drawn into a give-and-take reciprocated relationship that moves through time with the world. Craig finds good arguments on both sides. So he wants to say, used to be timeless, because there are texts that really seem to show that, and now not timeless, because obviously, look, he created and interacts with creation, therefore timeless and temporal. He says, with the creation of the universe, time began, and God entered into time at the moment of creation in virtue of his real relations. When he says real relations, that's code for reciprocal relations. That's code for, I give to God, God gives to me, and together in this give and take relationship, we move along a timeline or a time strand together. Okay? In virtue of his real relations with the created order, it follows, therefore, that God must be timeless without the universe and temporal with the universe. Okay? Most people who hold that view are devoted to Craig. In other words, that's not, generally, if you're not in his circles, uh, that's not a position that many uphold. uphold. But Craig and his... In his uh, uh, advocates, his acolytes, as it were, uh, definitely insist on this. Very strange. I mean, here's how it's strange. How can something not in time begin to be in time? If there's no succession of life, how can it begin to be what it wasn't? See what I'm saying? How could God, who's without time, suddenly begin to be what he was, what, what he was not if there was no succession? That, ha that, that now being in time has to follow after. How, could, how can something follow after timelessness? I'll let you think on that. Um, <laughs> and people shake their heads, and, Fran and Craig insists we don't understand him, and I'm sure he's right. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, then that's all right. Uh, the third po position I want to put out there is the timeless turned temporal God, or I'm um, sorry, timeless and temporal God, where it's not that God loses his timelessness, as the way Craig explains it, sort of forfeits it when he enters time, and it's not that God uh, was in any way temporal before creation, but that God must somehow be able to stay timeless in one respect 
and in some other important and ontological respect, be temporal. This is what I kind of call a mixed temporalist position that views God as timeless and temporal together. The, the, this view uh, is desirous to uphold a true confession of God's all-temporal eternity. Those who say this want to find a way sincerely to say still that God is timeless. I, I think it's an honest desire that they have. But they cannot conceive how simply saying that gives us enough relatability to account for creation and redemption. Therefore, we have to augment timelessness with temporality, all the while not getting rid of timelessness. Never mind that you're going to have to deny simplicity to pull that off, but... They do. This is what happens. So they maintain that God's relationship to the world as creator and redeemer seems to demand that God exist and act temporally in some respect. Therefore, eternity needs to be augmented, not displaced, not removed, but augmented, supplemented by temporality. Uh, Rob Lister holds this view. He says, again, there are certain divine attributes and certain dispositions of passion that God takes on in respect to creation. God takes on new attributes, new new divine attributes in order to relate himself to creation. These attributes or, or states of being that God assumes uh, are in addition to his essence, and they're for the purpose of relating himself to creatures in time. In other words, timelessness is kind of a problem because how can a timeless God relate to creatures in time? Therefore, God has to sort of augment himself, supplement, make up the lack by taking on some temporality in order to get near the world. Temporality uh, of action is a key ingredient for this. Lister says, I would maintain that part of God's accommodation of himself to us is in his taking on the property of acting in time. In other words, that's something new in God. God wasn't acting in time, but now he acts in time. So he takes on this, he takes on this, this new temporal active. In other words, God's acts in the world are really temporal acts. God's, God's creation of the world is really something God begins to do, whereas before he didn't. He's not... He's not He's, as creator, he is not eternal. That's part of the new package of attributes. Um, he says, uh, he says uh, that basically this comes about with creation. Lister draws a sharp distinction between what he calls pre-creational timelessness and his, quote, temporal participation with us following creation. See how creation is the key? Before creation, timeless. Now creation, temporal. But still timeless in some way. So God's temporality doesn't displace his essential timelessness, rather it supplements it, so to speak, in order to allow God to create and interact with creatures in time. His language, he says that God's unfolding experience of his covenantal plan occurs in the temporal progressive covenantal context. God is experiencing the development and outworking of his own purpose in time. Okay? John Frame if you know John Frame, you knew this was coming, uh, I think. Uh, John Frame proposes a model of God as timeless and temporal. Like Lister, Frame believes that, the beginning, that in bringing about his sovereign plan, God has to ontologically, in, his be in some aspect of his being, maybe not his essence, but some other aspect of his being. Of course, he can't, he can't be simple, but never mind. That's being ignored for the moment. God has to ontologically enter the, vic the vicissitudes of, of, and of time to be present to it. Now listen to this language of John Frame. Frame says, a covenantally present God, like a temporalist God, can know and assert temporally indexed expressions like the sun is rising now, now for God, just like for you and me. That's what he's saying. He can feel with human beings the flow of time from one moment to the next. I take it that these feelings are somewhere in God. I think that's what he's saying. He can react to events in a significant sense. Significant why? Because he's really there experiencing it. And it's, it's a real it is a real reaction, not just a decreed unfolding of an eternal plan. It's significant because it's God actually in time. It, like a temporal, as a temporalist God, he says. He can, he can react to events and times in a significant sense. He can mourn one moment and rejoice the next. He can hear and respond to prayer in time. Since God, listen to this. Since God dwells in time, therefore, there is a give and take between him and human beings. So God, this is, I'm still quoting. So God is temporal after all. That's frame. God is temporal after all, but not merely temporal. Oh, see? I can still say with the confession he's eternal, but he's still, but now he's temporal also. 
He really, and he goes on, he really exists in time, but he also transcends time in such a way as, as to exist outside of it. He is both inside and outside the temporal box, a box that can neither confine him nor keep him out. Partly temporal, partly not temporal. Okay, that's, that's in effect what he comes to. Now you might think, how does Frame hold these together, timelessness and temporality? It's tempting to think that Frame does what William Lane Craig does. Used to be temporal, or used to be timeless, dump timelessness when he entered relationship with creation, but that's not what Frame does. He does not, he does not shove off the old timelessness. Uh, rather, he thinks, of, he, thinks of, uh, he thinks of God's presence as actually both at once. He wants to maintain, and this is his language, that God is unchangeable in his awe-temporal and supra-temporal existence. So how is he really temporal if in his awe-temporal, supra-temporal existence he isn't temporal? The key is this, and watch this. This is wild. There's not just one existence in God. There are more than one exist. There's more than one existence in God. Now, that's not me trying to put a bad and dark spin on this. That's his own language. Stay with me. He ex- his doctrine, uh, the key to his doctrine is that he believes God's existence extends beyond his awe temporality. There are ways of being that he is in addition to his essence. As creator and providential lord of time, Frame believes that God exists as a changing being within history itself. He can say, uh, he says this because there are, his words, there are two modes of existence in God. What he means is the divine and then the new stuff that he became, the stuff that's now, the the new stuff, the temporal things that he now is, the God who's really in time, who who sees sunsets the same moment you do, who, who feels and has this give and take. Frame does not agree that the biblical talk about God, uh, about change in God, is merely anthropomorphic. He says if God changes, we can't simply say that's just an accommodated anthropomorphic way of speaking, the way Samuel Renahan does in his books. That's not, that's not going to do. Uh, we have to say somehow God really is undergoing change, because otherwise, you know, language isn't picking out God in a one-to-one way, right? So he says, uh, he says that if God acts in time, then he's really temporal, two modes of being. Listen to Frame again. History involves constant change, and so, as an agent in history, God himself changes. Folks, this is frame in a P&R book. What I'm saying is, this this rottenness is not out there on the fringes. This is is in the heart of the kingdom, so to speak. Um, this This is right there with good publishers, but this stuff gets through. God himself changes. This is frame going on. On Monday, he wants certain things to happen. And on Tuesday, he wants something else to happen. He is grieved one day and pleased the next. In my view, Frame says, this is more than just anthropomorphic description. In these accounts, God is not merely like an agent in time. This is his emphasis. He he really is in time, changing as others change. Yes, that is frame. He goes on. And we should not say that his awe-temporal, changeless existence is more real than his changing existence in time, as the term anthropomorphic might suggest. Both are real. What he's saying is states of actuality in which God subsists. Wait a minute. So God is timeless and God is temporal, and the one actuality is not the same as the other actuality. Well, what, how do you explain this? Frame actually is willing to ascribe two existences to God. One is timeless and immutable. The other is temporal and mutable. Both of these are, are existences of God. Now, you, you, you're hearing me say existences. Does Frame really say existences, plural? Frame says that this actually takes place at the beginning of, of creation. Uh, he says the difference between God's awe-temporal and historical existences, that's his word, I, this is unprecedented, begins, where does this begin? Where does this dichotomy in God's life begin? Where do you think it begins? Creation. He says this, this, distinct, this difference between God's awe-temporal and historical existences begins not with the creation of man, but with creation itself, close quote. At creation, God begins to be what God was not. His language can mean nothing but that. Um, God's act of creating is where Frame locates the origin of temporality. All right, briefly, one other, one other uh, 
person who introduces temporality into God uh, is K. Scott Oliphant, uh, who Richard, Richard likes to, uh, every time Scott Oliphant says something a little off the mark, Richard reminds everybody that he was my doctoral advisor. Um, and, he, and, he, and it says, Dalzell's mentor, as he keeps saying. Okay, well, um, I did, uh, I, I have no, I had nothing but, I had nothing but a positive experience personally with Scott Oliphant. I've never had crosswords with the man ever in my life and, and hope not to. <laughs> but there are problems. There are problems in the way that he presents God's relationship to the world. Now, he doesn't do what Lister and Frame do, which is basically say, was temporal or was, was atemporal, but now is temporal in addition to atemporal. He actually, he actually models this on the hypostatic union of the divine, nat- divine and human natures in Christ. He takes this as the key so that just as the Son is eternal according to his divine nature and temporal according to his human nature, That's not unorthodox. That's a good Chalcedonian distinction for sure. Just as he is temporal according to one nature and and, uh, eternal according to the other, so Oliphant insists that God uh, is eternal in his essential character and temporal in his covenantal character. Oliphant says that God takes on temporal properties without in any way ceasing to be essentially eternal. So essential properties and now temporal properties, he calls them. For Oliphant, like Lister and Frame, the fact of creation is, is the key for this acquisition of new, non-essential being in God. Oliphant says this, the fact that God interacts at all with creation presupposes his covenantal character. Now, be careful. Covenantal character is what God became in addition to being God. For Oliphant, that's a new way of being for God. He says, once he determines to relate himself to us, that is to say, once he, de- once he decrees to create, That relation entails that he take on properties he otherwise would not have had. He limits himself while remaining the infinite God. The fact that he is creator means that he is now related to something on extra to which he was not related before. Oliphant will say that God became creator. It's part of a covenantal uh, something else that he begins to be. Creatorhood itself is a new new property uh, that God takes on. Covenantal, a covenantal property. Uh, Oliphant says that God, quote, remains who he is, but decides to be something else as well. What could that be? It couldn't be God. See what I'm saying? If he begins to be something else, it couldn't be something else divine because divinity cannot begin to be. He goes on, uh, he decides to be the God of the covenant. Everything that God is as covenantal for Oliphant is the something else God began to be. In other words, the problem I have with that is, how could that possibly be divine? God as covenantal is now not God as God. It's God as the creaturely covenantal thing he became. Sort of like Jesus as man is not God. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's not unorthodox to say that. Jesus as man is fully human. Jesus, according to his human nature, eats and sleeps and grows tired and grows weary and undergoes suffering uh, and pain and, and, takes, and takes walks and enjoys sunsets and is, is creaturely in every way. We're not Eutychians. Jesus' humanity is not a little bit divinized and his divinity is not a little bit humanized. If the covenantal properties are like the, are like the human nature of Jesus, then everything God is as covenantal, he is as creature. That's the model for Oliphant, though. That's the explanatory key. Creatorhood, though, once he begins to, once he determines to create, that's the key. It's then that God begins to be what he was not, particularly temporal. That temporal. That's when he takes on and assumes temporal properties. My summary uh, of it is this: we we must observe. Uh, that altogether, every one of these views believes that God cannot create or bring about temporal effects without ontologically participating in the temporality of his creation. Whether that means dumping his, his eternity the way Craig thinks of it, or as never having even been eternal the way Wolstorff thinks of it, or as augmenting his eternity the way Lister, Frame, and Oliphant think of it, all of them agree that creation is an insuperable problem. God as eternal cannot be the creator because creator has to be something new in God. You know what? There was a time that sounded to me, I had a hard time thinking what the alternative would look like. Because that, the alternative was inconceivable. It is inconceivable, but it's believable. See what I'm saying? Is, there's a difference. So I want to finish briefly then with confessing the eternal creator. The general argument is that if, that if creator is something 
temporal that God becomes, this is my argument, it seems to follow that his actions in and toward the world as creator are not properly actions of God as divine. See what I'm saying? If creator is part of the covenantal package or, or, the, temp, or the new properties, the new temporal properties that Lister identifies, well then, well then, creatorhood itself is now not actually identical with the divinity of God. This is the strange implication. This means that creatorhood itself begins to be. In other words, creatorhood itself is finite, temporal, mutable, in a word, creature. Now the creatorhood of God is a creaturely feature of God. I, d I don't think people like Oliphant ever intended that kind of thing. I think it was a, a half-baked idea that had all these implications built in and not thought through. Again, I don't think anything sinister is going on, but something dangerous is happening. A creatorhood that begins to be cannot be regarded as, a, as properly an aspect of God's divinity as such. First, a couple, a couple points on this. Does God create eternally? I want to answer <coughs> yes. For the, temporal, for the eternalist, God's activity toward the world as its creator, sustainer, and redeemer cannot be divorced from what he is in and of himself. Bavink actually argues that God cannot have a sort of intermediary set of properties, uh, what, what, uh, what Lister calls God's acting in time and what Oliphant calls covenantal properties. Bavink says there can't be something that mediates between God and the world. That's Neoplatonism. That's a demiurge. Okay? Bavink says this, if it is God who posits the creature eternity which posits time, immensity which posits space, being a being which posits becoming, immutability which posits change. And then this is, this is Bravink's language. There is nothing intermediate between these two classes of categories. There is no intermediary, intermediating set of properties that God has to sort of take on in order to pull off his relationship to the world. But that's what we're being offered by Frame, by Lister, and by Oliphant. We also, secondly, would say that while we name God as creator from the effects of creation, the act of creation itself is not temporal. In other words, God didn't go to bed early the night before creation because tomorrow was a big day. See what I'm saying? It's, not, it's nothing like that. There's, no, there's, not, there's not God saying, tomorrow I become what I never was, <laughs> creator. Uh, I'm not, he's not gonna t so how is God eternally creator? The reason we say that God is eternally creator is because God's act of creation is really nothing other than his act of willing to create. God's act of creation just is his decree to create. So in a human planner, let's say that I'm building a house, I might, I might first plan or decree, if I want to use that language, purpose to build a house, and I'm going to get down and write up a blueprint. But there's a real distinction between my planning or my willing to build a house and my actually getting out there and swinging the hammer and driving the nails. See what I'm saying? The actual building follows the intention. What we're saying is that for God, the intention is the act of building. In other words, God's will, God's will does not need, my will to create, my will to build a house needs to be supplemented by something in addition to my will. I could wish all day long to build a house, but until I actually get out there and start using my, my motor faculties and swinging hammers and driving nails, my will is just going to be an unrealized dream. See what I'm saying? But with God, his will is not just a plan that then requires some other action in addition to his will in order to accomplish the plan. We are saying that God's will is itself the effective act of creation. God creates sheerly by willing it to be. That's, that's the act of creation, not something God began to do after for a long time uh, he didn't do it. Turretin uh, says that God, uh, he says that in, in creating, no new will enters into him, but only a new external work proceeds from his efficacious and omnipotent will. Efficacious and omnipotent will, that is to say, my will is not efficacious and omnipotent. I can plan, and I can tell you the truth, a lot of my plans never really do come to fruition because it takes a little more than planning for me to pull off the plan. You see what I'm saying? But for God, God does not need to supplement his planning with some subsequent activity in order to pull it off. The planning, the purposing, just is the act of creating. And insofar as God eternally purposes and wills the world, he is as such eternally, actively the agent of creation. And therefore eternally creator. Turton goes on, by the same practical volition, practical volition means not hypothetical, but actually working volition, which he had from eternity, he created the world in time, produced it in actuality in the beginning of time, but that act in God was not something God began to do, whereas before he didn't. It was nothing but the eternal act of his will. 
The question then is, does God create the world as eternal, or does he need to take on a temporal package of actuality in order to pull off creation and redemption and relate to the world? I close with the words of, of Herman Bobbing. Bobbing says, on the one hand, it is certain that God is the eternal one. In him there is neither past or future, neither becoming or change. All that he is, is eternal. Frame and Lister and Oliphant do not believe that. They're, they're clear they don't. All that he is, is eternal. His thought, his will, his decree. Eternal in him is the idea of the world that he thinks and utters in the Son. Eternal in him is also the decision to create the world. Now watch this. Eternal in him is the will that created the world in time. Eternal is also the act of, or is the act of creating as an act of God, because that's nothing but the act of the will. An action both internal and imminent. That is to say, in God. Now, Bobbing says this. For God did not become creator. So that first for a long time he did not create, and then afterward he did create. Rather, he is the eternal creator, and as creator he was the eternal one, and as the eternal one he created. The creation, therefore, brought about no change in God. God didn't begin to be what he wasn't. That which he created began to be, but his creating did not begin. See what I'm saying? I don't say, do you understand? I don't understand. I, 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 do, I, stand with, I stand with Owen and say, I confess, but I don't conceive what I confess, but I do adore. Peter Sandlin says, it's all too easy to assume that God experiences time in a manner very similar to us, albeit with greater insight and vision. He says, even if we accept that God as creator must be radically different than his creation, we struggle with temporal words to express this. I think that's right. We need to remember that. And I, I want to be patient with those that struggle to express it. I have struggled to express it. I, I still do. Uh, but I know this. I, I don't want to say that God begins to be what God was not. And if that means I have to confess that strange doctrine that God is eternal creator, uh, then so be it. I'd rather, I'd rather have mystery than theologically repugnant doctrines. That's, again, where we'll end. I'll, I will, I'll, I'll pray briefly, and then Rich will come up. Our God and Father, eternal in the heavens, exalted above all creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect, in perfect communion from all eternity. God, we bless you and we thank you. We confess the mystery. We confess that you are unattainable uh, to our comprehension, and yet you have made yourself known to us in your revelation and in the revelation of yourself and your Son in the fullness of time. God, we bless you for these things. Give us humility and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.